Oh, hello. I didn't see you there. I was busy reading my book. Have you heard your grandparents talk about this thing they used to do called reading? Old people are great. <laughs> this is what today's video is about. But first, we need to talk about my worst vampire movies list because I was raked over the coals by everybody for listing Van Helsing as number one. And although I am very grateful to you for commenting, we need to talk about how wrong you are and how I'm not gonna back down on this one because I was in line for that movie at midnight, the day that it came out, I was the one that put my heart and soul into waiting for my favorite triple threat, Hugh Jackman, actor, singer, dancer, to be in a movie about slaying vampires, and it was awful. It was awful, and I will not have people watching it on home video tell me that I'm wrong. I won't, I'm sorry. But, again, thank you for commenting. I hope you subscribed so we can argue some more. And now I'm gonna take a deep breath, and we're gonna talk about the best book adaptations. Mark, you remember Bridget? She used to run around your lawn with no clothes on. Starting out at number 10 is Bridget Jones' Diary. Bridget Jones, wanton sex goddess. Dad. Renee Zellweger plays Bridget, who I relate to because she's flawed and adorable, and she smokes too much and drinks too much, and she has to wear Spanx and nice dresses. Yes, are, uh, me, absolutely enormous pants. Bizarre what some men find attractive. She's torn between the bad boy and the square, but even if she can't see how great she is, I totally get how men could fight over her. Should I bring my dueling pistols or my sword? Major dilemma. No, it's not, girl. These are the things every woman wishes for. Let them fight. <laughs> and when Colin Firth says this, I always cry. The thing is, I like you very much, just as you are. Oh, don't cut to me now. Go to number nine. Dear friend. I haven't really talked to anyone outside of my family all summer, but tomorrow is my first day, and I really want to turn things around this year. The Perks of Being a Wallflower is unique because Stephen Chbosky wrote the book, the screenplay, and he directed the movie, and he did a great job on all three of them. Charlie is a kid who feels lonely and isolated until he meets weirdos who finally make him feel understood. Welcome to the Island of Misfit Toys. This movie's a 100% performance. Emma Watson in post-Harry Potterdom is great. Why do I and everyone I love pick people who treat us like we're nothing? Logan Lerman as Charlie will rip your heart out. We accept the love we think we deserve. And Ezra Miller should get an award of some kind. Call it Slut and the Falcon. Make us solve crimes. <laughs> and he should get a comic book deal because I would read that. Although the movie's darker than the trailer suggests, it's all really honest and there's something in there for everyone to relate to. You see things, and you understand. You're a wallflower. I didn't think anyone noticed me. Excuse me, I've got to go write nostalgic messages on my high school buddy's Facebook walls right now. In such a big, uncertain world, it's a relief to never have to ask if a Humphrey Bogart movie is good or not. Number eight is the Maltese Falcon. The Falcon has carried the mystery of a fabulous wealth under its grotesque wings. Bogey plays Sam Spade, a private detective who is as shady as he is sexy. I don't care who loves who, I won't play the sap for you. He's hired to help this poor woman find her sister, but you know that's not the end of the story. I haven't lived a good life. I've been bad. Worse than you could know. People start dying, and the subject of this jewel-encrusted bird comes up, and pretty soon, Sam Spade is waist-deep in treachery and passionate kisses. Haven't you tried to buy my loyalty with money and nothing else? What else is there I can buy you with? by Dashiell Hammett was a real page turner, and the movie still holds up as one of the best mysteries ever. It's so fun to watch Bogey be aggressive with the bad guys and the ladies. Stop it, the police will be here any minute, now talk. Oh, how can you accuse me of such a tip? This isn't the time for that schoolgirl act. We're both of us sitting under the gallows. Did I mention how creepy this movie gets? You may have the falcon, but we certainly have you. Ugh. Peter Lorre was so fantastically upsetting. Hey, so speaking of birds, you know they descended from dinosaurs, right? I read that in a book. Anyway, number seven, Jurassic Park by Michael Crichton. What do they got in there, King Kong? It was put in the hands of that director that you may know, Steven Spielberg. I saw this movie about a dinosaur amusement park gone awry when I was at a very tender age where I didn't fully appreciate all the questions of morality and science and nature that Crichton is so good with. Uh, because I was too distracted by stuff like this. A wolf. <laughs> I got all of that. Plus, the puppet effects by Stan Winston look great. 
Man, I still get just as scared now by the velociraptors as I did back in 1993. Ah, this is why I always lock doors now. Thanks a lot, Steve. Must go faster. I feel lethal. On the verge of frenzy. I think my mask of sanity is about to slip. American Psycho by Bret Easton Ellis is a brutal and hilarious book that made it to the screen mostly intact, which is surprising considering its reliance on inner monologue. I have all the characteristics of a human being, but not a single clear identifiable emotion. I simply am not there. Patrick Bateman is played by Christian Bale before he had a permanent frog in his throat as the Cape Crusader. Where were the other drugs going? He's a homicidal yuppie in search of just the right business card to shame his co-workers. Whoa, very nice. When I first saw this film, I couldn't understand how it could be so violent and make me laugh so hard. I know my uh, behavior can be erratic sometimes. But now I think I've got it. Hey, Paul! This movie is for the sicko in all of us. I just have to kill a lot of people! Nearly everybody was forced to read number five in school, To Kill a Mockingbird. While I was reading it, I thought I was just doing homework. But after finishing it, I had the distinct feeling that something important had just happened. In the movie version, Gregory Peck plays Atticus Finch, who defends a black man wrongly accused of raping a white woman. I've been appointed to defend Tom Robinson. The sad byproduct of his work to do what's right is that his children lose their innocence, learning that evil exists. The movie gets a little heavy-handed sometimes, but if anybody can put you back on track, it's Gregory Peck. Want to tell us what really happened? I got something to say, and if you ain't gonna do nothing about it, then you're just a bunch of lousy, yellow, stinking cowards! Number four isn't so much just one movie as it is an entire series. I cheated a little bit because Harry Potter deserves it. Over the duration of seven movies, Hollywood seemed as open to experimentation as a freshman in college. Remember that first one where it was heavy on the magic but really light on quality? I'm going to bed before either of you come up with another clever idea to get us killed. Or worse, expelled. She needs to sort out her priorities. And it was entertaining and sweet but that boy wizard could not summon good effects. Do you really have the scar? Oh. Wicked. Fast forward six movies later and everything is on point. The series got a lot darker. Would you have allowed your friends to die for you rather than face me yourself? And we can finally say the name Voldemort because Harry is pushing him off the buildings. Come on, Tom. Let's finish this the way we started. Together! Bravo, Hollywood, and the talented folks working on this series. Only I can live forever. The eye of the enemy is moving. Okay, so while I'm cheating, number three goes to the Lord of the Rings films because there is not a weak film in the series. And I have a thing for Harry Feet. All told, Frodo taking the ring to Mordor with the help of his buddies lasted at least nine hours and I still could have watched more. It's the ultimate in stirring buddy action quest movies for everyone, myself included. Special mention goes to Andy Serkis' Gollum, whose talent in acting during motion capture has made us acknowledge a whole new kind of performance performance in the digital age. Even if he did want to murder us. He makes to murder us! Papa! I know, Sam, I know. Oh, did you see his face right there? Oh, crap, we're in trouble. Mario Puzo in his book showed us the meaning of family, and Francis Ford Coppola brought it to life in the Godfather series. It's absolutely one of the best of all time, and if you disagree, how does it feel to wake up every day of your life and be so wrong? Aside from the great cast and captivating story about a mafia boss and his family's shift in power during tumultuous times, the reason I love this film is because watching it is like going to film school if your class was titled How to Make People Care About Your Work and Watch It for Decades to Come, ensuring DVD sales and re-releases for the rest of eternity. It's not personal. It's strictly business. I can't imagine my life without having watched this film. It especially taught me what questions not to ask at weddings. Now you come to me and you say, I'm calling you on the giving dust. You come into my house and you ask me for the murder. It also made me really glad that my family's profession is accounting. They want to get mixed up in the family business? You got to get a close like this, and a bing, you blow their brains all over your nice side release suit. My number one book adaptation ain't going to teach you nothing about birth and no babies. 
Gone with the Wind. This is a film that helps remind you what's really important in life. Scarlett O'Hara is a privileged woman from the South when the Civil War breaks out, ruining her shot at making out with lots of cute boys. Can you honestly say you don't love me? No, I, I don't love you. It's a lie. And when the war ends, things do not lighten up on her at all. You'll never corner me, Red Butler, or frighten me. You've lived in dirt so long, you can't understand anything else. Not only is this movie an enduring epic with incredible sets and costumes, but it shows how people can really step up to the plate when their loved ones need them the most. And even when the chips are down, you can still make out with boys. Kiss me once. Ten Academy Awards and a firmly rooted place in history make this an unforgettable movie. And if you disagree, well, I'll just let Rhett take this one. Frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn. List as it stands right now. This guy is going to get made into a feature film really soon, and I'm not sure which list it's going to end up on, but as long as they say throbbing a lot, we're all set. Subscribe, comment, do the thing. Let's talk. In the meantime, I'm going to get back to my book. Gray Drake puts a stake in her top 10 best vampire movies of all time. Uncle Al and Jack argue if it's aliens or North Koreans attacking Seattle in Red Dawn. Ben Lyons interviews Twilight screenwriter Melissa Rosenberg and gives his take on new movies hitting the big screen. In honor of Red Dawn, Phil Gower plays Take It or Leave It with Adrian Palicki and Josh Peck. Devin Faraci hangs out in Bob Burns' basement where he discovers some of the most amazing film and sci-fi memorabilia. J.B. Smoove and his buddy Garfield can't get enough Twilight as they tell us what they heard about Breaking Dawn Part 2. Get your film fix. Subscribe to Cinefix.